<laughs> this is a different view. I like it. I tend to move around the camera angle on this little porch so that I can kind of give different perspectives and kind of look around and see things differently. And then I bring my plants <laughs> from inside outside for maybe a shot or two because it's cold enough that I think the chill would kill them. So I don't really have much on the porch except just kind of like decorative stuff. Usually from the 99 cent store. <laughs> but it adds a little something to my wife sitting out here when she smokes or when I come out to either pray or record videos. It's kind of nice you know, to have something, you know, that I like to call them little memorials or thoughts, things that change the focus of your attention on other things like God or good feelings or just something different. You know, it's interesting as I was looking at uh, today's devotional and one of the things that I'm kind of excited about this week is we've been, my wife and I, talking about our demo that we did of uh, Wives Tales where we just sat together and shared and talked about really just normal things that we talk about. And I asked her questions and she responded. She had fun with it. And we had laid it out as a feast to maybe do it, you know, as a ministry, you know, because she has a perspective that's different than mine. <laughs> and I have a perspective that's different than hers. And so do you. I'm much older in the Lord than she is. And she brings a different viewpoint, though I have to admit, while I may have influenced her in a lot of ways, I've not taught her directly because I felt that all people, irregardless of who they are, should have a personal relationship with the Lord, that they should discover Jesus while we may share and bring the introduction to them and start them on their journey. But they need to discover for themselves also. You need to provide the environment for them to grow. I do that with my wife. I allow her to choose the direction that she would like to go with God personally. Now, when we're together, I make decisions. You know, I'm older, so I ask her opinion on things. But in the final analysis, you know, so her discernment is where I can respond to it and feel that God is leading her. I choose to make the decisions, you know, and be accountable for them because, after all, I will be accountable for them, <laughs> just like you. But we did this video, you know, called Wise Tales, and we kind of enjoyed it, you know, it was, it was fun. And we want to talk about topics, you know, about relationships, you know, kind of the fallacies, you know. Fallacies just means, it's like the word truism. They're just things that people think are true that really aren't. You know, like a penny saved is a penny earned, that's not the Bible, or cleanliness is next to godliness, that's not true. You know, there's a lot of things that people sometimes think is in the scriptures, and I thought with my wife it'd be fun to share those. And then also, maybe with wives tales, give a wife a wife's perspective. Because here I am, you know, sharing daily on ministry as well as my relationship with the Lord. But what does it look like from a wife's perspective? You know, the same person, you know, how does he relate to her? And is he the same as, you know, what he portrays himself out to be? As any man of God will tell you, what you see is what you get. Usually most men of God, now I'm not gonna say ministers and pastors because I leave that up to them as they are. Most men of God are just the way they are. I mean, that's just who they are. They they acknowledge grace in their life. They're forgiven for their sins. They acknowledge that they're human and they fall down at times. I mean, to me, that's what a man of God is. It's not some super saint, you know, and I don't try to live up or measure up to some standard that someone else sets. But rather, you know, I walk humbly as much as I can, you know, within certain parameters of my own personality and experience that God is changing me into. So, 
we've enjoyed, you know, doing that video, and we plan on doing it once a week, and uh, maybe more, who knows. We're also going to tackle some tough topics that I'd like her to share her input, because I've said things to her that she agrees with me on, and I would like to share them with other people that are really hard topics that maybe you don't hear in a Sunday sermon. You know, you don't necessarily have someone telling you, well, this is an opinion. It's not really in Scripture. It's not biblically sound. It's just something that people believe in because that's the best answer they can come up with so far. Now, those topics are questionable sometimes for some people because they have some ideas they've grown up with that, like I said, they're kind of like wives' tales, you know. It might be a good idea, but <laughs> the truth is, are they scriptural or are they biblical? Kind of like the age of accountability. You know, people have used this wives' tale, this mythological age that they've created out of something that isn't there. There's nowhere in Scripture that we're told there's a certain age of accountability. And the reason it came about is a long story. And, you know, when I deal with that topic, we'll discuss it with my wife, and it'll be on Wives' Tales. But the long and the short of it is, is that you can look it up on Google or, you know, any other teaching. And most pastors have had to admit at some point in time that there really isn't an age of accountability. This is where people have gotten it from, but there isn't such a thing as that. It's just a, an idea, you know, an intellectual, an intellectual assertion that has been presented as a means of communicating an idea and theology that isn't true, but might be. So, anyways, we've had fun with doing those videos, but then just recently, I was over the weekend praying about it, and I almost made a demo for it, you know, but the Lord just told me to do it, so we're going to, my wife and I, together, are going to do a, uh, a series, which I, I am excited about, which is why I'm sharing it. We call it Upwards, no, Afterwards, <laughs> Afterwards, and it's spelled A-F-T-E-R-W-O-R-D-S, because a lot of times when people go to church, you know, they get a message, which is good. Most of the time, they experience a lot of worship and a little bit of work. Or they may go to, say, something like a Calvary Chapel where they do get a lot of word and a lot of worship or a balance. But the question I ask, and something that I've always been good at, but not lately have I had the opportunity to do, is... What happens afterwards? In other words, A-F-T-E-R-W-A-R-D-S. In other words, what happens after Sunday morning? Do you remember what was taught Sunday morning on Monday morning or Tuesday or Wednesday? Because most of the time, I have found in ministry that most Christians can't regurgitate, can't remember or relive or discuss throughout the week what the pastor has taught on that Sunday. Whatever it is that the Lord has spoken to them, sometimes if it was, you know, really impacting, yeah, they might remember one part. But the question would be, if we are there to study and to learn, well, what happens afterwards that causes us to forget it so fast? And I think that's where part of the idea of what Sunday morning isn't is where we're going to approach the subject of what it should become. Because in my experience, we used to have a Sunday night service that we would just blast out of our minds because it was so long. First of all, a long Bible study, and it had long worship, and it wasn't time, you know. If there were times that the pastor decided to go longer, he went longer. <laughs> when he got older, he, he began to time it out. But at first, okay, he just stayed. <laughs> but even then, we had what used to be called an afterglow, that afterwards, we would go ahead and sit around and talk about it in the sanctuary. 
until, you know, another pastor, <laughs> I'm trying to keep this without saying who, um, would kick us out of sanctuary because he said, look, you got to go home. <laughs> but we would stay up all night. And then sometimes we'd go down to an all night coffee shop and still be talking about it. And it was wonderful. And then there were other times where an afterglow was, you know, for gifts of the spirit, for worshiping more, you know, just doing that only, you know, and words of wisdom, words of knowledge and healing, stuff like that. But God spoke to me just this last weekend. And I, in home Bible studies, used to be the one who could initiate and cause there to be a response or a direction of learning and understanding that would come out in the discussion part of the Bible study. And to me, that was what was called the gift of teaching. To me, a gift of teaching is to draw out the ability of a person to learn on their own and to give them and equip them with the tools to do it for themselves in the midst of a presentation. In other words, most of the time what <clears throat> pastors are doing nowadays is more dissertation than it is teaching. It's more a lecture and then you're assumed to go out and study on your own. And, you know, maybe you did, maybe you didn't, but you're really learning what he studied. So it's not, it's not really a teaching ministry unless you think of collegiate as teaching where you're told what to do and you go do it. <coughs> but in my estimation, and especially when I lived in Israel, I found there was a different style and a different mannerism to Jewish learning and also to Jewish discussion and methodologies of learning that could be discussion and involve conversation. So I was discussing with my wife and talking to her about how I wanted to go to, however she decided, the same service that she was in, whatever it may be. And then afterwards, we could have after WORDS, that after the service, then there would be afterwards a discussion of what happens afterwards, you know, some words about what happens afterwards. And we would discuss what the pastor taught and, you know, how it applied to us and what we thought was good and what we thought was bad. Not evaluating pastor per se, but rather evaluating what we thought was profitable or, or necessary or even applicable to ourselves, you know, and how we felt about it. And so when I was praying about it, you know, and in the shower as usual, you know, the Lord told me, call it afterwards. So me and my wife talked about it and I said, well, you know, because my wife goes to a different church than I do, because whenever <laughs> pastors know this and men of God and ministers and different people, but when you go to a church, sometimes if you have a A-type personality, you seem to attract attention. And so a lot of times I don't go to the same church my wife goes to because, you know, anonymity is a little hard to find when you're someone like me. And after a while, you know, you just want to go in order to enjoy whatever's being taught and worship. But somehow you get dragged into other things and having been in the ministry for so long supporting other pastors and elders and deacons or whatever it may be the ministry part it's hard to just <laughs> sit in the back although that's the part i love because i sing loud and i enjoy it whatever it may be but so anyways my wife and i we talked about it we said well why don't we just pick a video maybe and both watch it as part of our joint studying together because it would be beneficial to me to learn something as well as beneficial to her and then we in afterwards we could really apply it and then we would both grow not just as individuals but as a couple and so it kind of led me in my own life that I thought would be wonderful in her life and she agreed and I was surprised you know and amazed you know but not really because you know, sometimes when I share, you know, that's why I try to be careful. She agrees with me most of the time, you know, <laughs> except when we fight, as any one couple does. But <coughs> what we did was we decided to use Francis Chan's videos. He's a an interesting pastor, you know. He's a, a man of God. And I relate to him in a personal way in the sense that 
I enjoy what God is doing in his life and how God brings through his word to him. And for me, I'm interested. I don't have much to say. I, I rarely have met someone that I would really enjoy just listening to. Most of the time, I have to kind of bite my tongue. <laughs> and you know what I mean. When you know too much, you know too much. And uh, God bless them that are learning. You know? But anyways, I enjoy his teaching and it teaches me and instructs me and it helps me to become more of a man of God that I feel that God wants me to be. So I see in him a lot of what I want to be and want to be encouraged by through the ministry that God has given him. And so we decided on using Francis Chan and his videos and we watched one and said, yeah, let's do that one. I mean, let's do that pastor. And so we're going to do that. And it kind of ties in with today's devotion was that it helps us as a couple to draw closer to the Lord, you know, in a way that's going to be fun and exciting as well as challenging. And that's what I'm trying to share with you is that don't be afraid to try new things with your wife, with your friends, with your neighbors, with your relatives. If you enjoy something, hey, talk about it. Get together. Share a CD. Say, hey, would you like to talk about this sometime over coffee? Would you like to go out and have a donut, you know, or whatever? It <laughs> doesn't matter. I don't know what it is for you. But you will never get so close to God as when you are with other people that don't necessarily agree with you. Because when you choose to stick together no matter what, you will grow by the knowledge that together you will share if you'll share what you're all learning at the same time. And that's kind of what Jesus did with the disciples. But in today's devotional, be determined. Even when we were dead in our own shortcomings and trespasses, he made us alive together in fellowship and union with Christ. He gave us the very life of Christ himself, the same new life which he quickened him for. It is by grace, his favor and mercy which you do not deserve, that you are saved and delivered from judgment and made partakers of Christ's salvation. Ephesians 2.5 Paul said, my determined purpose is that I may know Christ and the power of his resurrection, the power that lifts me out from among the dead, even while I am in the body. See Philippians 3, 10 and 11. You can use every day to get to know God in a deeper way. Read the Bible for understanding of what he wants to reveal to you and receive his grace to be lifted out of every past fault and let his power lift you into life his way. So if I could encourage you, you know, Check it out, you know, maybe watch our videos. I mean, I don't know, you know, <laughs> that's why you're watching this one. But check out doing something like afterwards, you know, after church sometime, you know, invite someone to maybe go somewhere and talk, maybe share. Or I like to call it, you know, if I, you know, I told my wife I'll lay out a fleece and see if it ever happens. But... I said, you know, if some church ever asked me to come teach, you know, I said, I'd probably jump on it, you know, because my personal opinion is that we may not always be heading in the right direction, but if you had a small, intimate body of believers that, you know, you really ought to, like, if it was a Sunday morning, have, like, kind of a Sunday morning service, you know, and then afterwards have, like, a picnic, you know, either picnic it in a restaurant or picnic it in the park or someplace, but have a Sunday go-to-meeting, so to speak, where you have after-church chicken. <laughs> Kentucky Fried Chicken, yeah, and Pepsi, woo. But you know what I mean. Have a potluck every Sunday. So people would always have a meal with the Word, or the Word with a meal. Because as much as we say worship goes with the Word, so too food and fellowship should be going with worship and the Word. My opinion, maybe, or maybe I'm right. But the point is, if it was free and everybody brought it, then those who were without food could take home that which they want to. And if there was always extras left over, I think people would catch on the idea of why they bring extra. You know, because there's always people in your church somewhere that's poorer than you are. It might be a need. But who knows? Maybe that's just an idea of mine. Maybe it's a word for you today. Or maybe it's just a chance to enjoy the goodness of God 
with people who are your family and friends at church. Get to know somebody a little more intimately when you are at church. And you'll find they just might want to know you a little bit more too.